Good morning, brothers and sisters all across Southern Africa. Uh, welcome to our online service this morning. I'm KK from the church in Botswana. Let me just invite you to be with us and ask you to dance if you can dance, to clap if you can clap, and not just sit there and be part of the service. I'm going to ask our brother Roma from the church in Madagascar at this point in time to lead us with a word of prayer. Roma, please. Hello from Madagascar. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the one mighty God. We are here today to give you glory to your name, to praise you in spirit, with our heart, with our soul, because you are the only God, our salvation. Today we are here shouting for joy to worship you with gladness, O Lord. We are here many nations gathering to praise you with jo joyful song, to sing your love, to sing your justice and your grace. We are standing in now to see how you make it possible. Thank you so much for the technology. Thank you for such blessing that you are demonstrating that your kingdom is an unshakable kingdom. Despite the change bring this, uh, by this disease, Nothing can hold your church to give you a holy praise, O Lord. Even in the middle of this globally concerning anxiety, we are unshakable but glorifying you because in you lay our peace and our victory. I am praying especially for those disciples who are in pain and those who face desperate situation. Please don't hide your face from, you, from us, O Lord. Strengthen our bones, turn our ears to our prayer. May your spirit be with our leaders, our ministry. Inspire us to be able to overcome our challenge, be able to support your church and minister your gospel with wisdom. Strengthen us with, uh, with boldness, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Tanja so at a rita bina. Rita bina bina sa ipilo. Mutanja so at a rita bina. Rita bina bina sa ipilo. Bye. 
is, is a, a flicker, flicker of light burning and, and piercing, piercing through the darkness in the hardest of times. Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 21. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God had the power to do what he had promised. Hello everyone, Rapula Malijani is my name. Many of us have watched the news with a lot of anticipation and expectation. We have prayed, we have fasted, we have hoped, we have wished, and now we cannot wait for the day when every country in the world will report good news and victory over the pandemic, the coronavirus. This is hope we are talking about. It is the desire of watching in expectation for a better day. It is searching the news, searching the platforms for a promise, for a better day that will be coming tomorrow. Many of us are very excited that the issues with the coronavirus are finally coming under control. A lot of countries are reporting recovery cases. Many are bringing down the lockdown rules and regulations. The numbers of deaths are coming down. And we are excited as we see the statistics giving a promise for a better tomorrow. And we are on the downward part of the curve in many places. This is real hope. This can be felt throughout the world. The scripture we opened with Romans 4 verse 18 to 21 says, Abraham believed in hope against all hope. Now we know that Abraham was a man of faith. He would do things that God called him to do. Things that some of us would feel, man, really, God, are you, are you calling me to do that? Abraham would go on and do that without question. But you see, his faith was accompanied by hope. He had hope against hope. Where it was hopeless, where there was no reason to hope, Abraham had hope. How does that look? It says he faced the fact that he and his wife were both too old for childbearing. Their bodies were as good as gone. However, he did not waver in his unbelief. He actually was strengthened in his faith. The scriptures say that being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised to do, Abraham actually gave glory to God. Now, with all that was against the promise, Abraham thanked God for a promise that by all human intent was impossible. You know, he waited in expectation, in anticipation. He waited in hope. Like, Abraham, you know that your body is as good as dead. You know that you are like, you know, ancient. Like, yes. that, you see? I'm going to be the father of a nation and I just cannot wait to see this thing start. I'm waiting for my first born. This, my brothers and sisters, is hope. We know that in the case of the coronavirus, the kind of hope that we feel throughout the world is we are actually able to feel it. There is gladness in the heart as you watch the news, the good news. However, this hope is based on evidence. If tomorrow we hear that there are a thousand new cases in Africa and you know, 10,000 new cases elsewhere in the world, that hope is going to fail. We're going to be overcome by fear. There will be no more hope for a better corona-free tomorrow. In the case of Abraham, there was no hope, yet the Bible says he had hope. It was hopeless. 
You know, there was no evidence that the promise that God had given him would come true. Actually, there was evidence. The evidence was all against the promise. He was old, he, was, he could not bear children at his age. The evidence was overwhelming that the promise would not come true. But the Bible says he had hope. Against that kind of evidence. You know, it's like when someone says the virus is here to stay, it's going to wipe out the whole world, and you go out and plan a party and dance and celebrate for the day when the virus will not be there. People will think, are you crazy? What's going on with you? Shouldn't we be praying for... But Abraham, against hope, believed. When King David spoke of Jesus and the things that he would do for the whole world, for mankind, there was a lot of hope in his words. When the prophet Isaiah spoke about Jesus, there was a lot of anticipation, a lot of hope in his words. These men spoke about Jesus as if they were talking about things that were in the plan to happen in the next couple of hours. There was a lot of hope. But they were talking about things that would happen thousands, centuries of years to come. Yet they spoke about them as if they were things that, you know, in a few hours these things would begin to unravel, they would begin to come to, to pass. That is the kind of hope that we are called to. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. It says, For the grace of God has appeared to offer salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. It says here that the grace of God teaches us to live godly lives. But then what? Grace teaches us to live godly life. You know, okay, we accept that and we live godly lives. Then, then what? Then we wait. Then we wait in hope. What is that? This is the appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is our hope. As Christians, our hope is not based on evidence, you know, in the same way that we see the world basing their hope, you know, about the coronavirus on evidence. It is not fragile because of what could happen tomorrow. It is a living hope. And so we live today in a way that suggests that we are convinced, that we know that there is a better eternal tomorrow. We live today in a way that says, I don't need proof. I know tomorrow is coming. I know eternity is coming and it's going to be a beautiful, awesome tomorrow. Eternity. Our hope is not like a young man who's on a date and he's thinking, yo, for my sake, I hope that she shows up. No. Our hope is you get yourself ready. You perfume yourself. You wash up. You comb your hair because you know she is showing up for the date. So my brothers and sisters, in hope we wait, but we live today in a way that says, I know my Lord is coming. I know there will be eternity. No matter what goes on around the world, I don't need proof. I don't need evidence. I don't need the statistics. I know God is coming. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially those who believe. In a similar way that he taught Titus, 
Paul teaches Timothy to lead. He goes on to say physical training has value, yes. But godliness training has value for all things. He says, in fact, that it holds promise for this present life and for the future. He says to him, this saying is trustworthy. That is why we work so hard, because we have put our hope in the living God. Our hope is not on the medical people to find a vaccine. Our hope is not on the politicians to give us direction. Our hope is not on a better tomorrow, on the freedom from lockdown. Our hope is on he who has our eternity in the palms of his hands. Our hope is not fickle, my brothers and sisters. It is not weak. It is not about the rest of our lives on the face of this earth. Our hope is about eternity. It rests on a faith that is in our God. Our hope is bigger than this world can have about a corona-free world. It is heavier. It is brighter. It is bigger. We can feel it more. If the world can be excited about the corona-free world, how much more should we be excited about our eternity? How much more should we live like people that are convicted that we have a brighter tomorrow, that we have a better tomorrow, that we have eternity stored up for us? This is hope. The blessed hope that the Bible speaks of. The living hope that we hold in our hearts. When you understand this hope, we will see in how you live. It is very difficult to put it into words. In Timothy, it says that is why we labor and strive. In Titus, it says we live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. You see, the hope I'm talking about shows itself here and now, today, while we wait. It shows itself in how you live, in how you labor and strive in how your life is self-controlled, upright, and godly. You see, without this living hope, there is absolutely no reason why you should change your life. However, if you understand this hope, this living hope, then no one has to tell you that your life needs to change. We will begin to see it in your life. It will become clear that there is something that you are hoping for in the future, that there is something that is captivating your heart, that there is something that you are living for now in this life today, it will become very evident. So what does your life say about your hope? Is it clear that you have more hope for and about the coronavirus than you have about eternity with God? As we conclude, I'm going to ask Kato to share about what hope means for her. Enjoy the rest of the service. Amen. Hello, my name is Katsa and I'm going to be sharing about what hope means to me. So for me, hope is just a state of mind that believes and desires for a positive outcome to life situations. It is um, just a voice of my purpose and where my dreams begin. Um, it was always that um, to remind me that I may not be able to control what happens to me, but I can control how I respond. And I find that, that like with every breath that I take, hope is being availed to me, and it's just a gift from God. Um, and that small window to look through um, because sometimes my prayers go unanswered and tragedies such as this epidemic occur despite all of um, our prayers and faith. But for me, what helps me sustain my hope is just knowing that God is there um, during the worst of times and in Him I lack nothing. And it just helps me hold on to the belief um, that my, my existence here on earth is temporary and that I am being prepared for eternity. And I just hope that God gives me the strength um, and courage to endure my challenges and heartaches, knowing that better days um, await me, which is why my hope extends beyond um, my worldly existence, making my ultimate hope heaven. Um, thank you. Hang <laughs> on.
Mamsindi Siwetu Oh Asifela Let's come by many I Tena si pume mwamle sweni Si chete le lizono Si sindi siwe Aya yo yo Bie ye Tena tena si pume mwamle sweni Si chete le lizono Si sindi siwe Aya yo Tina tina si pume mwamle zweni Tina, 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 Good morning. It's a privilege for me to share a few thoughts to help prepare our hearts and minds for the communion. I have taken part in a number of extreme sports events over the years, and three things in particular helped me to stay focused on race day and to push through the suffering and the pain and the cramps, and also to ignore that little voice in my head that tells me it's okay, Neil, to drop out, you know, no shame in not finishing, etc. Uh, firstly, um, I am always encouraged by the fact that I am not alone. Uh, not only do the spectators encourage us uh, during such events, but the participants encourage one another. That really lifts me. Uh, just seeing the example of the other participants and also just hearing uh, words of encouragement and encouraging others as well. That helps. Secondly, on race day, I try to be as light as possible. And I'm not just referring to my physical weight, but I carry as little as possible on me uh, or on my bike. It just helps to be light. And then thirdly, uh, for me in particular, a very powerful motivation to finish is to picture, envision the finish line. When I'm really suffering, I imagine myself approaching the finish line, I've been cheered on by spectators, and having my beautiful wife meet me at the finish line and saying, well done, lovey. Uh, now, these three principles that I've just shared are very relevant to the life of discipleship, as we read in Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Now the author is writing to Christians who were suffering immensely. Uh, there were hardships. Uh, it was tough being a Christian. And many of them were considering or had already fallen away from the faith and reverted to Judaism. And, you know, the author encourages them and he encourages us to stay faithful by firstly being inspired uh, by other people of faith. The cloud of witnesses he refers to are the heroes of the faith listed in Hebrews 11. But we also have a cloud of witnesses, you know, faithful brothers and sisters that we should look to and hang out with and let their faith rub off on us. We are not alone in this race. You know, let us encourage and be inspired by one another. It's important to help us stay in the race. Secondly, uh, we are to throw off any extra weight that hinders us and that clings so closely to us. Now, anxiety and the worries of life and sin are real in this age. You know, we never get rid of them completely. But it's important that we do not let them weigh us down so much uh, that they take us out of the race. We need to stay as light as possible, just by being open and by getting, by getting help. And then thirdly, we need to look to Jesus. We need to look forward to Jesus, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Jesus has blazed the trail. He is the pioneer. You know, Jesus is at the finish line waiting to welcome us and to say, well done. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the suffering and the shame of the cross. And it is the same for us. It is a powerful motivation, just envisioning and imagining uh, finishing the race and finishing it strong. We, we are able to endure suffering now if we, if we focus on and hold on to the hope of resurrection, you know, the joy before us. And this is a sure, certain hope. It is not just wishful thinking. It's a promise of God. And we need to hold on to the hope of the resurrection and life in the age to come. And imagine Jesus welcoming, welcoming us at the finish line, welcoming us into, uh, into that age. Let's bow our heads and pray. Uh, thank you, Father, for uh, your love for us that is demonstrated uh, so powerfully through the, through the sacrifice of your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to endure the suffering and pain and shame of the cross. Uh, I pray that you will help us to, uh, to take encouragement from the fact that we, are, that we are not alone, that we run this race together with our brothers and sisters. I pray that you will help us to, to not be overwhelmed and overburdened by, by sin and anxiety. Uh, help us also to envision the finish line uh, when we go through hardships and face temptations to quit. Help us to clearly see you uh, King Jesus, waiting for us to welcome us into the age to come. Thank you that our resurrection to new life is not just wishful thinking, but that it is a certain hope. Father, increase our faith uh, to live out that hope now as though we have already finished the race. Amen. Oh
Southern Africa. My name is Mwakaledi Monamati, commonly known as Action. Let me start by thanking my brother Neil from Port Elizabeth for the encouraging communion message, a remembrance indeed of our Lord's sacrifice. And now for some great news as God continues to encourage us. Here are some people who have put their hope in God and were baptized recently. From Swani Campus, Bonolo, Cape Town, we have Sani, Mtata, we have Nandipa, Zambia, we have Ignatius, Harare, we have a couple of them. It's happening there. Tadiwa, Sam Keliso, Papalo, Pezisai, Munashe, Smangaliso, and also Alice was restored in Harare. Now, if you didn't get enough of today's message, don't worry, you can follow the link below and you can watch at your own time. And for those who are staying in Botswana, you can find today's message and the previous ones on the link that will appear at the end of this message. Our contact details will also appear at the end of this message. We are so grateful that we have been able to worship together. At this time, let me invite my brother Araujo from Angola to close for us with a prayer. My brother, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Juju, and I am from Angola. So first of all, I just want to thank you so much, Rapula, for the great message. I think that hope is something that, as a disciple, we can never lose. And I am sure that each one of us is living here with more hope in God. So let us pray together. Dear Lord Almighty, thank you so much for this great opportunity. Lord, we believe that everything that happens has a purpose, that you are in control of everything. Even in these situations, dear Lord, with the coronavirus, we still believe in you, Lord. We still believe that your message still being spread, being preached, and I believe that hearts are being touched by your message. Please continue with us in this difficult times that we will hold hold into our hope that God you will lead us into heaven one day God thank you so much we pray all this in your son Jesus name amen